Professor Mahan uh, Sani, uh, uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be with you here today, and on behalf of our executive uh, members, uh, just want to thank you for your time and perspective. Uh, I know that you're a professor at uh, the Kellogg School at Northwestern, and uh, I know you've been recognized as one of the most influential people in e-business. One of the things I was struck by was uh, you know, your comment that uh, we all need to realize um, that, particularly given this convergence, that the smartest people may not work for you. Uh, what are the implications of this kind of collaborative innovation for human resources and the way we staff and manage people in the organization? That's actually a very interesting challenge because what you now uh, realize is just a give an analogy that uh, what digital technology has done is now software can be bought as a service. So instead of owning software, instead of owning products or servers, you can get it on demand. So let me take that analogy and get into the human resource realm. What about talent on demand? Expertise on demand? You know, scientists and R&D professionals on demand? That's what these marketplaces represent. That you can now, you don't need to have people on staff permanently. You can activate expertise on demand by reaching out to this pool of talent that's out there. So I think that as you push this thinking and logic further, let's look out a few years, I feel that there may be organizations and entities created that are simply virtual ad hoc networks of people coming together to solve problems. So this sort of notion of the virtual network organization. Um, and it exists today in one industry, and that's the movie business. And how do movies get made? You know, people don't work for anybody. Yes, there are studios, but when you create a concept, somebody writes a script, and the producer gets involved, the director gets involved, they assemble the talent, and after the movie is made, they just all dissipate into the ether. So this kind of, you know, this notion of the opportunity-based organization. Hmm. So, so the implication really will be that, A, we need to get more flexible with our staffing and with our skilling of people so that they can be cross skilled So it's something that I talk about is instead of having business units and functions alone, how about opportunity-focused organizations? Which is that if a company sees an opportunity, a team gets created, and you know, an organization gets created to coalesce around that opportunity, much like a movie script, and then it kind of dismantles. You, you, have to, you need to create more fluidity in the roles, responsibilities, and in, inside your organization. Plus, you need to tap into these contingent pools of human resources that are outside your farm. Okay. So overall, we are sort of, you know, I'm arguing for what might sound like a very chaotic model for human resources, which is that uh, it's open season on anybody in the company. They can flexibly move between projects and between functions, and, uh, uh, and, and as well as that you can reach outside on an as needed basis to complement and supplement the input that uh, the capital that you have. Okay. So overall, I think that this is that, that what we will see, therefore, is more fluidity, uh, more flexibility, and more openness to external sourcing of talent. And in this process also, some or more of this talent is now going to come from emerging markets. So okay. there's a massive new untapped mm -hmm. pools of talent. What are the implications then uh, with regard to collaborative innovation and what it's going to require of individuals and particularly leaders? Uh, you just talked about some of the potential implications on human resources and organizations and flexibility. Uh, at the enterprise level, uh, what what's really going to be required at the personal, individual, leader level in order to open up to these possibilities? I think at the leadership level, uh, collaboration starts with a shift in the mindset. You know, it starts with a shift in the perspective that we are the best, we know what we need to do, and we know enough to act on this ourselves. So uh, perhaps the first thing that a leader needs to embrace is humility and the notion that we have a lot to learn. You know, we don't know everything. That there is a lot of expertise that we need to reach into and tap into. So that's first sort of that realization that we need to and we can and we can benefit from collaboration. The next step as a leader is to infuse this mindset in the larger organization. That requires extensive communication, repeatedly banging on this, you know, being on a soapbox and talking about the importance of 
looking outside, being external, letting go. Because it's the letting go and but there's some risk involved. As you become open, as you reach out, there may be loss of intellectual property, competitors may come in and sabotage your efforts. And, you know, so there are a lot of you may lose control over the innovation process. So those are all risks that you do need to take. But that's where leaders need to sort of say, it's okay. We have to let go to grow. We have to embrace open. So embracing open. That's the communication task. The third task for a leader is roles and responsibilities. As I was mentioning in my talk, somebody needs to be in charge. So you need to have to create specific roles that are directed at facilitating external innovation, connected innovation. Uh, and uh, so I think that leaders have a succession of sort of uh, things that they need to do, starting with opening the mindset, communicating the open mindset and collaboration, creating roles and responsibilities in the unit, and then holding people accountable. Terrific. Mahan Birsani, thank you very much for your time and perspective thank today. You. Thanks.